are here every other Friday at 12.30 p.m. taking on a new topic. So today's topic will be what's new in AWS Cloud, featuring Eagle Dream's AWS partner ambassadors, Scott Weber and Justin Guzzi. So if you're new, a little bit about 20 minute tech break. We take 20 minutes to answer four questions with two experts. So we hope that you'll learn something new today. So um, Scott, if you wouldn't mind giving a little bit of back on what your experience is and what you do at Eagle Dream, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, as Valerie said, I'm Scott Weber. I'm the Vice President of Cloud Solutions here at Eagle Dream. And uh, myself and my team of solution architects oversee the technical direction um, and working with our customers as they migrate or expand their footprint in the AWS cloud. And Justin is one of those uh, principal cloud solution architects that uh, reports to me and works uh, alongside me in helping our customers. Justin, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Hey, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for joining. Uh, Justin Guzzi, as Scott had mentioned, um, I'm a principal cloud solutions architect here at Eagle Dream. Um, and my role here at Eagle Dream is to really help our customers uh, design, build, and, and support uh, cloud native architectures in AWS. We'll just get right into the questions. These will be our four questions for today. Yeah, so I'll, 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 I'll start this off. So why is it important that your, your team, as you continue to do more in AWS, be aware of the announcements that are coming from AWS? Um, this is actually a really critical thing, and by no means is this easy to do. At the rate at which AWS makes product announcements and new feature releases in 2019, I think they were over 2,500 new releases in the year. I fully expect this year will probably be over 3,500. Um, but, you know, it's really important because sometimes these releases will indicate uh, new services that you could enhance your architecture that could provide better performance to your architecture. Sometimes these releases can be cost reductions and new services that at a reduced cost that with maybe slight tweaks to your architecture and to your application, you can, you know, achieve a cost savings. Justin, what's your opinion here? Uh, I'm totally on board with you. Everything you just said there, Scott. Um, I, yeah, I, it's incredibly important uh, to to be aware because uh, many times when we're working with customers ourselves, um, you know, if, if a feature set is not there um, and it's something that our customers are looking to implement, it's probably there's probably a good chance that other customers are looking to do the same. Um, so staying on top of those, uh, there's a very good chance that whatever it is you're looking to do with a particular AWS service, that it's probably right around the corner uh, uh, to to be supported. Um, so staying on top of those really will, you know, help you and your business to um, always ensure that you're deploying the latest and the greatest. Yeah. So let's jump right into this. Um, Justin, I know that this is one that you have a lot of hands-on experience with, but the new AWS Snow Cone. So talk mm -hmm. to us about it. Yeah. So AWS Snow Cone. So um, if anyone is familiar with the Snow family of devices, um, these are small rugged devices kind of think of them initially as uh, hardened rugged computers um, that AWS can send to you and then you can use them for a couple things. So one would be uh, to, you know, if you're in a remote location and you need some type of compute, um, you can actually use it to, you know, run machine learning models, run EC2 instances, um, basically kind of off the grid. Um, the other main purpose of a, of a snow device really is for large scale data transfer. So um, these snow cone, or sorry, the snowball devices, which are, were the initial devices that AWS initially came out with, um, can hold anywhere up to 80 terabytes. Um, and you can load your data onto those securely and then send them back to AWS and they'll take that data and they will load it into S3 for you. Um, so uh, within the last year, they came out with the AWS snow cone uh, which is a smaller version of those uh, snowball devices. Um, and it's actually really cool. So I actually um, ordered one of these because I wanted to get my hands on it and see it. So this, the snowball, like I said, is about the size of a uh, uh, mid-tier uh, PC tower, I guess you can kind of think of it. And then a snow cone is probably about the size of a, a thick textbook. Um, I think it weighs about four pounds. Um, it has two CPU on board and four gig of RAM. 
Um, and you can store up to eight terabytes of data on it. Um, and it was super, super easy to use. Um, you essentially take it, hook it up to your network. Um, you launch the, uh, the Ops Hub software to manage the device. It shows up, you unlock it. Um, and then you can actually interact with the device. This is uh, unique in that this snow cone device, you can actually use it to send data to AWS using their AWS data sync service. Um, so it does everything that the snowballs do and, and a little bit more on top of that. Um, so super easy to use. I actually transferred about 400 gigs of data uh, to AWS and my own personal business and um, personal documents and photos and things like that. Loaded it up, sent it back in a, in a few days. It was loaded up into S3 um, and I can access everything in the cloud. So really cool device, super easy to use, especially with the new interface. Um, so anyone can get started with it today. That's really cool. Um, you know, I, I know not every customer has a need for these devices, but when a customer does need them, it makes all the difference in the world. And now having the compute combined with storage on Snowball Edge and, and, and snow cones, um, it's really opening up some really interesting use cases by customers. Moving on, um, there's, there's a move in industry, you know, containerization continues to grow within this, within the, uh, the software development application develop, and development industry. And there's been an announcement recently of the new uh, app to container tool that AWS has launched for both Java and .NET based applications. And this is a really um, interesting tool because it's the goal is to alleviate the complexity of taking an existing Java, uh, Java Tomcat based web application or .NET web application running in IIS and making it easy to, to wrap up that running application into a container to allow you then you know, deploy it out on top of, in case of a, of a Java app that was based upon Linux, you know, into a Linux container running maybe on top of Fargate. The .NET applications get wrapped up into um, Windows-based uh, containers, but there's still so many advantages to getting to, to a containers um, model. This tool uh, is a little bit different than some of the AWS tools. It's, it's a set of, um, it's, a, it's more of a command line tool. You go and you download it from AWS uh, and set it up and install it on your machine. And on the, on the Java side, for the Java side, it's, um, it's command line on the Linux prompt. And on the .NET side, it's uh, some PowerShell scripting, uh, obviously to run inside Windows. But what the tool will do, it will lead you through the commands that you need to take. And at the end of it, you will have your application wrapped in a container and the beginnings of a code pipeline to be able to then further deploy your container out in the future. And then all that's left for you to do is take the Docker file that it's creating and the app spec, um, the, the task definition file and integrate those into your, your source code directories and, and your CI CD processes and your development processes. But in the past, there was a lot of manual work that would have to be done to figure out exactly how to, you know, wrap all the dependencies and everything up into a container. So this is going to be, I think, a huge step forward in helping customers. We have some customers that are starting to evaluate the tool today um, as they're trying to, you know, get to the latest and greatest because getting the containers, regardless of the platform, is an opportunity to save cost, but also increase scalability. Um, on the .NET side, you know, the best you can really achieve for scalability of Windows servers in AWS is, is on the order of 15 to 20 minutes from the time you need a new Windows server because load is increasing on your application to when that thing is, that server is up and ready to go. But containers, you're looking at like one minute or less type um, uh, time to scale up those containers to get them usable by, by your application. The same applies on, on the Java and Linux side takes three to four minutes for a Linux server to come alive and be ready to go. Again, on a container, you're looking at less than a minute. Um, Justin, what are some of your thoughts around this? Yeah, I, I think it's really cool because um, you see AWS is really closing that gap between, you know, what you've got running today and getting it to the cloud. Um, and you kind of like you said, Scott, um, you know, it, there was a lot of, you know, manual intervention and heavy lifting to to really containerize an application. And this you can literally do within minutes with the tool installed and containerize and package up an application and start running it in ECS. I mean, 
you know, th this is just one of many tools I think that AWS is going to unveil to make that process easier and really focus towards developing new technologies and developers in particular, you know, how, how can you get them to the cloud and get them onto these new platforms quickly without them having to do a lot? I mean, this is a, a great example of a tool like that. Yeah. So if there's anybody in the audience that wants some more information, um, again, if you just search for app to container, you'll, you'll find the AWS page dedicated to it, but also feel free to reach out uh, to myself or Justin. Uh, we'd be happy to, you know, help you with it, assist your team in evaluating it. So let's move on to the last question. I'm actually going to broaden this a little bit more. And Justin, let's talk about, you know, the, the recent announcements, not just for the T4G instances, but the, I'll say the, 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 the R6, the R, uh, M5, and the C6G instances as well in this discussion. So you want to kick it off and sort of explain what that little lowercase g is so important about? Yeah, so um, a couple of years ago, Amazon unveiled um, that they were actually coming out with their own ARM-based processors called Graviton processors. So that's what the G stands for. Um, so a couple of years ago, they came out with the first generation of that. Um, you know, it was unique in that it was custom silicon that Amazon had actually worked with the company to develop and build. Um, and then uh, last year, they came out with the newer version of the Graviton, the Graviton version 2, um, which had some features around um, increased, increased performance. So it's like 7% seven, 7 or 7 times more performant than the original uh, version of the Graviton. Um, you know, larger caches, faster memory. Um, so this was really big um, in terms of, you know, what Amazon can really push out from a hardware perspective. Uh, these T4G instances, so this family in particular, um, you know, there's a there's about a 40% uh, price performance ratio improvement over the current T3 instances, which don't run on Graviton processors. Um, so, you know, this is really cool to see Amazon kind of taking the charge, uh, maybe taking a little market share away from Intel and AMD um, and really, you know, running running their own hardware. I mean, they've already done that for their Nitro hypervisor. So, initially compute and EC2 instances ran on open source hypervisor software, and then they went and created their own hardware-based hypervisor. Uh, so this is just another example of this. Um, and as Scott mentioned, there's a whole bunch of uh, other families that are running these uh, Graviton-based processors. So in, in order to run these, you really, it needs to be a operating system that supports um, ARM-based architectures. So really, almost all of the Linux uh, distribution supported, nothing for Windows. Uh, at this point in time. Uh, but Scott, I don't know if you wanted to share anything else about those uh, Graviton-based instances. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 as AWS always does when they come out with new, new generation of, of instances, I mean, we saw this in the transition from you know, M4 to M5 with the Nitro architecture or any time in the history that there's been an upgrade. You know, the instances are faster and typically at a lower cost point. The Graviton, um, the, the specs that are out there um, are, are amazing, quite frankly. So you're looking at like 40% uh, increase in performance on the, the new G-type uh, instance types. And so, you know, if today you're running, you know, a Java application on top of Amazon Linux, Amazon Linux 2, or one of the other Linux distributions, you know, I, I would be encouraging you to like run to this type of update. I think I saw a tweet on, uh, on something on Twitter, uh, maybe that, um, that Werner Vogels retweeted that um, one of the major, um, a very major name brand company just completed migration to, to, to all Graviton instance types and just saw an amazing amount of performance increase across the board. Um, there's also 40% increase in performance of running workloads like MySQL. And the other thing to also understand is the Graviton instance types are now available in RDS for MySQL. I think that's the only supported engine right now. Obviously, I would expect to see Postgres be support be coming really soon as well. Um, the, those sort of legacy licensed databases are probably gonna take a little bit longer, if ever, to, to move to this architecture. But uh, also, if you're running containers workloads, quite frankly, if you're running fleets of EC2 servers for containers, um, again, I'd be looking at you know, how fast can you get to these new instance types? Again, assuming you don't have RI purchases or something like that that are constraining you, uh, 
forty percent performance increase at no no net, at lower cost point or equal cost point. Um, you know, this is a, this is actually going to help our customers save money, right? I mean, you're going to be able to down you cut back on the number of instances or the sizes of instances that you're having to run um, with these new processor types. Yep, and if you're interested in trying them out, um, Amazon is offering a free trial around the uh, the T4G micro instance size till the end of December. Um, so you don't necessarily have to still be part of the initial free tier when you spin up an AWS account, you can utilize this today and they'll automatically deduct it from your bill if you want to try it out. So great way to get started if you want to check it out. Perfect. Well, thank you, Scott and Justin, for um, going over those latest updates. If you want to learn more information on AWS Snowcone, Justin has a great blog on his experience with Snowcone that Scott actually just dropped the link to in the chat box. We also have another blog on AWS updates that was recently released th this past Wednesday, so feel free to take a look at that as well for any more details. Um, moving on, we will be opening it up to Q&A, so please feel free to raise your hand and we'll be able to call on you and unmute you, or you can feel free to type your question in the chat box and then um, Scott and Justin will answer the questions for you. Let's see. Any questions coming in? So we have Calvin who's raised his hand. Just one second, Calvin, I'll just unmute you. If I can find you. Well, I'm muted now. Oh, perfect. Feel free to ask your question, Calvin. Yeah. Um, hi, Justin and Scott. Um, oh, yeah. So, yeah, I was just, I mean, since I'm home and I don't have much to do and I'm new to this, new to AWS and stuff, I was looking at like some like networking related AWS things and I saw, and then I came across like reInvent coming up. So like, I wanted to know what could I, expect from reInvent as like someone who's new to AWS and to something new coming up in terms of networking from AWS side? Yeah, so um, so reInvent. reInvent is the is the yearly um, worldwide developers conference for all things AWS. Um, you know, this is seventh year for it, Justin. Yep. Seven, three. Uh, so. Typically, it's 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 four or five days out in Las Vegas the week after Thanksgiving. However, this year with COVID, um, they've announced that they're taking the whole um, event uh, online and virtual, and it's actually going to be free for everybody to attend. So if you just do a search for AWS reInvent 2020, you'll find the the landing page where you can sign up for updates. Um, I think that there's a lot of questions from all of us right now. What is this really going to look like this year with it being virtual? They're also saying that they're expanding it to three weeks long, which, you know, really has me scratching my head personally. How is this really, really going to work? Mm -hmm. However, anybody that's new to AWS would definitely encourage you to, you know, uh, sign up, attend what you can, definitely make the keynotes um, that, that are done by Andy Jassy and Werner Vogels. Mm -hmm. There will be a full, um, course catalog, if you will, sort of like when you were in college of all the different um, sessions that you'll be able to go to. Again, I think we're all just trying to wrap our head around what it's going to mean that it's virtual and, and there hasn't been a lot of details forthcoming yet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Valerie, it looks like we had a question get dropped into the chat. Um, when using app to container, does the application being converted need to be cloud native? Um, you no, know, I mean, that that's the whole, you know, it could be an, a Java application or an IIS based application that you're running on premises today. Um, now, obviously we may not want to run, move the front end of our application into AWS running on containers without some consideration of typically, you know, after talking to databases behind the scenes of what that's going to mean. Um, but, you know, that's the whole, whole sort of point of the tool is take this application that's running today, standalone on a Linux OS or an IIS, wrap it all up into a container, 
and then allow you to deploy it you know, into AWS, help set up the code pipelines to enable you to do that. You know, there is a lot of customers that are longtime AWS customers that weren't ready for containers at the time that they built their system in AWS. So this is a tool to help them get more modern, but it's also a tool to help a customer that isn't in AWS modernize and get to some more modern frameworks for running their, their application. Perfect. Um, I don't see any other questions, so feel free to take the next couple minutes to ask any other last minute questions if you'd like. Feel free to raise your hand and we can unmute you as well. One thing to add to around reInvent, uh, that initial question, is those keynotes tend to, they tend to unveil some uh, new services and new features. Um, so if you're, if you're looking to stay on top of some of the latest and greatest, um, I would definitely stay tuned in to the keynotes, um, especially if you're maybe anticipating something coming out. Um, and it's a great way to really learn about AWS technologies overall. A lot of, a lot of great courses, a lot of great um, sessions that they have, everything from really 100 up to 400 level. Um, so I encourage everybody to at least check it out at some point throughout the three weeks. Yeah, and feel free to stay up with Eagle Dream as well. Like we will be giving real time updates on the event and telling you what's happening and what's new with um, the latest technologies that are announced. But it uh, looks like we have a couple more questions. So we have one from Tyler that says, as ambassadors, is there anything coming down the pipeline that you're allowed to share? Justin, you want to take that one? Yeah. Uh, no, unfortunately, uh, we can't. Um, we do sometimes get the inside scoop on some services or things that are coming, but it's typically under NDA, unfortunately. So um, as excited as we are and want to share it, unfortunately, we cannot. <laughs> and then we have another question from Mark that says, I don't know if this is in the realm of this course, but can you take a Docker and convert it to a container? When, you, when do you use one over the other? Yeah, I'll take that one. So Mark, I think, you know, we tend to use Docker and, and container are pretty much one in the same. You know, Docker was the one who brought the, the, the concept of containers to the forefront and really named it. So when we're talking about app to container, we're converting that application running standalone to running in a Docker container. You then take that Docker container and decide how you're going to deploy it using probably using Amazon's Elastic Container Service being the simplest way to get up and running with containers. Um, if you're an organization that's exploring Kubernetes, um, you know you could go down that route. And, and honestly, you probably could use App2 Container to convert an on-premise application and then run it in your Kubernetes cluster on-premise as well. So Container and Docker are you know, I'll say Docker is the more specific implementation of container. A lot of Linux OSs, you know, going back years and years and years had the idea of containers, change root jail is, is essentially a container. Um, but so I think, and sort of bad on us, you know, we, we tend to just say container when we mean, you know, Docker container in today's lexicon. All right, uh, we have just a couple of minutes. Feel free to get in any last questions. Uh, from Mark, once again, it says, how mobile is a container? So containers are, are very mobile, which is why there's a lot of interest in them right now. Um, the other thing about containers is the uh, isol isolation that they provide um, for your, your executing environment. So you can take a container um, you know, from on-premise to a cloud provider or to a different, and from one cloud provider to a different cloud provider. When we get into actually running containers though at any scale at all, um, well, there's really two choices. You can statically provision that running container onto a virtual machine. Um, you know, that gets you just running a container, but it doesn't get you scalability, you know, inspection of how things are running, things like that. That's why there's things today, you know, on the Docker side is Docker Swarm. AWS has Elastic Container Service and Elastic Kubernetes Service. You have just Kubernetes in general that's out there that a lot of organizations are using. What those are classified as is orchestrators uh, for your container, containerized environment. And they are the orchestrator is then responsible for the deploying, the monitoring, you know, the replacement of the containers, which you use when you want to do deployments to actually push new containers out and replace currently running containers. So when you, when you start down this container path, there's a lot of new terminology, um, some things that you got to come up to speed with. 
Um, but I'll tell you, you know, one of the, I think the easiest ways to get started on containers, especially with AWS, is just leveraging their Elastic Container Service. Um, it's very easy to use. It's very robust. It's very mature. Um, you know, we help a lot of customers get started on their container journey looking at that tool. Great. Um, so it looks like we are approaching our one o'clock mark. Um, thank you to everyone today that attended and thank you Justin and Scott for answering all those questions and giving us the latest updates. So for our next 20 minute tech break, it will be October 23rd featuring Cross River Bank. And we will be discussing how Cross River is evolving the future of financial services with cloud-based solutions. And this will feature Jesse Honigberg from Cross River as well as Scott Weber. And I see we have another thing in the chat. Oh, thanks. That was a thanks from Mark. But um, thank you so much for everybody attending and have a great Friday. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.